بسم الله أوله وآخره السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Yesterday we looked at the memory of the child and recognized memory to be something of tremendous importance that if your memory is damaged your capacity to think will be diminished and what is happening to our children now in this age where we are inundated with electromagnetic waves all around us in the cities is that the memory of the child is being damaged we spoke yesterday about the imagination. When the child reaches the age of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and how the imagination must be fed so it can expand and expand and expand. And the natural environment to trigger off the expansion of the imagination is all around us in nature. The child must interact with nature, with the trees and the flowers and the birds and the wind and the, wa the waves and the sea and the clouds. And in this interaction with Allah's book out there, the book of nature, the imagination can expand. And instead today the child is hooked to the smartphone and to the cyber world which is an artificial world and so the growth of the imagination is stunted and then we spoke about aptitude that Allah creates us all with different aptitudes and it is the function of the teacher, of the mother, of the father, the uncle, the imam, to spot the aptitude of the child and to allow this river to run in the direction that Allah has ordained it should run so that it can become a big river and not to move in another direction. This is the direction you'll end up with a Mercedes-Benz motor car. <coughs> Today we want to go beyond memory and the imagine. Oh, I also forgot about history in expanding the imagination. The child must read history, be told stories. My son was seven years of age when I started to teach him the Sira. And I would teach him every morning while he's having breakfast. It took me six months to complete the Sira. And when I was finished, guess what he said? He said, Papa, start again. <laughs> start again. And as your child is introduced to history, to the stories of history, and the best storybook of all of history is the Quran, the Qasas Olambia, the imagination of the child will expand. This is the age for expansion. This is the age for building as big, as broad, as foundation as you can build so that tomorrow you would have versatility. You would not only become a medical doctor, you also become a philosopher, you become a mathematician. The sky is the limit. And this is being stunted today because the child is being deprived. The young people are being deprived of this food that they need and because of this artificial world which is presented to them. Now today, we move beyond this now to something called the akal. Uh, the akal is the intellect. And we are told that the intellect resides in a place called the brain. But that's not the 
The Quran doesn't say that. The Quran speaks of akal as an activity that is located in the heart. It is the heart that engages in intellectual activity and the brain is but an appendage used by the heart for processing purposes. A processor. <laughs> and uh, the heart processes, the heart interprets, the heart penetrates knowledge in two ways. And this is called, this is a branch of knowledge, don't be scared by this big word, it's called epistemology, the study of knowledge, the branch of knowledge which studies knowledge. And this is the heart and knowledge. Nabi Muhammad said, every prophet has warned his people about the job. Do you notice how slowly I speak? Do you notice how I pronounce each word separately? I want you to be teachers. And what I teach, I want you to teach to others on the condition that you're convinced that I'm teaching what is correct. Every prophet has warned his people about Dajjal. And the prophet Nuh alayhi salam warned his people about Dajjal. But I am going to tell you something about him no one has ever said before me. Hence, this is of more than simply passing importance. The Jal sees with the left eye. He is blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. But your Lord, is not one-eyed. Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word kafir. And every mu'min, mu'min being someone who has faith in the heart and faith is not sold in the supermarket, Every mu'min will be able to read the word kafir, whether he is katib or ghayru katib, whether he is literate or illiterate. What do we make of this? Uh, there are those, uh, I fondly refer to them as schoolboys, <laughs> who, when the Jal stands up in Jerusalem eventually and declares, I am the Messiah, and uh, all those who are one-eyed, including those Muslims who become friends of the state of Israel, even in Britain, these traitors in our ranks, I don't want to see your face. I don't want to shake hands with you. Don't bring, come before me if you're a Muslim and you embrace Israel or you embrace this, this government of India. Get out of my sight. I don't want to see you. How dare you come to me? When this man stands up in Jerusalem and says, I am the Messiah, the schoolboy will say, no, you cannot be the Messiah. Why? Because the prophet said, the Messiah has the word kafir written on his forehead. And every mu'min will be able to read it. And I can't see the word kafir written on your forehead. So you are not Dajjal. <laughs> that's, that's the schoolboy because he lacks the capacity to think. I don't know, because maybe because he became a friend of the state of Israel, that's why he lost the capacity to think. So why is it that Abu Bakr Siddiq can read Kafir, but uh, 
Abu Jahal cannot read it. What's wrong? So we send Abu Jahal to the eye specialist. And the eye specialist checks him out and his vision is perfect. So now we have a puzzle. Abu Bakr can see on the forehead of Dajjal the written word kafir, but Abu Jahal cannot read it. Why is it that he can see and he cannot see? Is it that uh, Abu Bakr is not seeing with these eyes alone? Is it that, uh, that we have to ask the question, do we have any other eyes besides these eyes? Schoolboys don't ask these questions. <coughs> this is epistemology. Dajjal gives one answer, which is modern Western civilization. And modern Western civilization says, no, these are the only eyes we have. We have no other eyes. And so knowledge comes, as I said yesterday, from observation, from experimentation and rational inquiry. But the Quran says, no. The Quran says that knowledge comes not only from external sight, but also internal sight. Will they not travel to the earth? That by traveling to the earth, the dead heart might come alive. He doesn't, the Quran doesn't speak about the brain. The Quran speaks about the heart. That the dead heart might come alive. And with the dead heart which comes alive, you now be able to recognize and think and understand what otherwise you could not. <coughs> and with the heart which has come alive, you'll now be able to hear what otherwise you could not hear. Now listen. For in the La ta'amal absar. وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبَ الَّتِي فِي السُّدُورِ What is blind is not these eyes. What is blind is the heart which is inside your chest. This is a completely different epistemology. The knowledge comes only from external observation. That's their view. The knowledge comes both externally and internally. This is our view. And so Dajjal's most formidable attack on mankind is epistemological. It, Dajjal seeks to reduce our educational system and a house of knowledge only to books that you read. I read that kitab and that kitab and that kitab and that kitab. And now you make you an alim. Yeah, I memorized this and that and that and that and that. That made you an alim. You pass the examination, you now become an alim. What a load of rubbish that in this miserable age we have to live to witness this that you have to pass an examination to become an alim we never had this rubbish in all our history that there is something called an alim course we never had this rubbish in all our history Never. And yet today we are told there is something called an alim course. 
And when you study it and you pass your exam, you're an alim. What a load of rubbish. That's why we are in the mess in which we are today. Because it's only external knowledge. This kitab and that kitab and that kitab and that kitab and that kitab. <coughs> that is the house of knowledge that has led us into this mess in which we are today. This is what is producing the scholars of Islam today. So when Musa Islam said, <laughs> yes, I am the most learned of all men. I have to cut some corners because of time. Eh? And then Allah said, no, you're not. He says, I want to meet him. <laughs> and when he met him, when he met him, you know, Musa is not actually the prophet here. It, the name of the prophet is being used as a front for Banu Israel. And they say of themselves, we are the chosen of the Lord God. We are the intellectual elite of mankind. I don't think they want to charge me with anti-Semitism for that because they're proud of it. <laughs> we are the intellectual elite of mankind. So Khidr al-Islam is sending a message. When Musa said, I want to follow you, to learn from me what Allah gave to you since you're the most learned of all men. So what does Musa, what does Khidr al-Islam say to that arrogant world of knowledge? That arrogant world of knowledge that closes the doors of the masjid to someone who wants to study, teach the Quran? <laughs> These are the two loveliest verses of Surah al -Kaf. I've always said, when you come to my grave, if you don't see it, put it there, please, on my grave for me. Innaka lantasdatiya ma'iya sabra wa kayfa tasfiru ala ma lam tuhit bihi kubra This is where we have to build a new house of knowledge in Islam. You cannot bear with patience with what I have to teach. No. And how is it possible for you when it, it lies beyond your capacity to comprehend? How can you bear with patience in respect of that which lies beyond your capacity to comprehend? It is because of these two verses of Surat al kaf that I have said, with all the good that the Darul Rum is doing, and they are sincere people, and they are dedicated people, and they devote so many years of their lives, and so not for me to speak ill of them, and to, to try to make to humiliate them, that would be very sinful. But if you believe you can change that system of knowledge and education, <coughs> when they feel this, they have this arrogance, yes, it is an arrogance, that our system is correct and it cannot be changed, then you're whistling in the wind. And that's why I have said, the future belongs to those who will build a new, board, new model of education and knowledge for higher Islamic learning, a new model. And this new model is, is here in this, in this part of today's lecture. That he is the most learned of all men because of two things. آتيناه رحمة من عندنا وعلمناه من لدنا علما Allah gave him knowledge directly, directly. So this is not external knowledge, this is internal knowledge. And Surah Al-Kaf is saying that internal knowledge will never cease. Never cease. Allah will constantly send down knowledge on his servants. But we have to show kindness. We have to show patience, yes as I have consistently have to show patience, 
except that sometimes I lose my patience, I have to admit. When you have knowledge coming directly upon you from Allah, and Allah will choose the servants he wants to send, it doesn't matter whether you are the Obandi or Brelvi or Ahlerit or this or that or the other, it is Allah who will choose. And when Allah sends down that knowledge upon you, then only the Khidr alayhi salam, only he is the model of Islamic scholarship in Akhiru Zaman. So when Musa alayhi salam set out to meet him, Allah said, you will find him, as I said yesterday, at Majma'ul Bahrain. This should be the day at the top, the motto of the institution of Islamic learning in Akhiru Zaman. This is Majma'ul Bahrain, the place where the two oceans meet. So the schoolboy will say, is it the Atlantic or the Pacific? But the one who is a critical thinker will realize, no, no, no. This is the ocean of knowledge externally acquired and the ocean of knowledge internally received. And these two worlds of knowledge have to come together and be harmoniously integrated. You are seeing Imran sitting in front of you, but the knowledge is not for me. The knowledge is for my teacher, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadl Rahman Ansari. It is his words that are coming to you. That these two worlds of knowledge must be harmoniously integrated. We saw a spark of that. Oh yes, a glittering spark of that in Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, who was not the graduate of Adarul. If Iqbal was the graduate of Adarul Loom, he would never have become an Iqbal. Never have become a mufakir, a thinker. So we have a we have a, a very significant problem to deal with. We are stuck with the Darul Loom. We do not want to be disrespectful to them. We do not want to hurt their feelings. All right? But how do you transform them when they shut the doors on you? Answer, you got to build a new house. When Maulana Fadl Rahman Ansari established the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies in Karachi, and I was one of the first students of that institute. And they looked at us, they laughed at us. They said, this is neither fish nor fowl. <laughs> what kind of a dark room is this man creating? They're not laughing anymore today. No, particularly here in Britain when they're feeling the fire now. Then they tried to copy what he was doing. And they started putting political science in the curriculum and economics in the curriculum. And guess what they do? They will get a, a lecturer in political science to come and teach the political science class and a lecturer in economics to come and teach the economics class. And this side of the Darul room continued unchanged. But that's not what Maulana for the Roman Asari did. No. We were taught politics from the Quran. And we were taught economics from the Quran. So when I left the Institute of International Relations of the University of the West Indies, I told you yesterday I came first in the class, so I got a further scholarship to go to do the PhD in Geneva. And this is the most prestigious institute in the whole of Europe, the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva. And I'm in the classroom of economics, sorry, international economics. And my teacher is Professor Curzon, a distinguished professor of the institute. And he couldn't take the heat. <laughs> 
because every day I was challenging him in the classroom. Because your economics is all bogus. I could do that because I had the Quran. And I was taught economics from the Quran. I was taught how, how to study the Quran. Do you know what the professor did? I don't think it ever happened in the history of that institute. He called me aside one day, he said, Mr. Hussein, you know you don't have to attend my class. Just write the exam at the end of the year. It meant I don't want you in my class anymore. The heat was too much for him. I took the exam at the end of the year, I passed the exam. <laughs> so this is Mr. Mr. What do you call Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Two different worlds of scholarship in the same Darul Ulum. On this side is this one, on this side, and they're not connected to each other. No, says Maulana for the Rahman Ansari. You have to integrate the two worlds of knowledge harmoniously. And to integrate them harmoniously, you need the Quran. And to use the Quran, you have to have the proper methodology for study of the Quran. And this is what Allah is teaching us in the encounter between Musa alayhi salam and Khid. It's not just a story. The boat and the boy and the wall. It's not just a story. In these three encounters, there is a profound lesson being taught about two epistemologies, two houses of knowledge. This one, inadequate and defective, cannot work in Akhiru Zaman. This is the house of knowledge for Akhiru Zaman, the one which stands on the foundation of Khidr alayhi salam. Why is this so important? Without the Quran, we cannot restore knowledge. As uh, Faisal was saying, once upon a time, we were the intellectual leaders of mankind. Yes. If we are to rebuild that house of knowledge, it is with the Quran. Is there anyone who differs with me? Well, then why did Allah put two kinds of verses in the Quran? Many questions I ask and they don't have an answer. Why? Because they never thought about it. And I am here in Britain to invite them to think. My next lecture in Leicester, I'm inviting you to come. It is uh, two nights from now on the Quran and the moon, a methodology for recitation of the Quran, and would you kindly bring your children with you? Once they're over 10 years of age, please bring them. The ayat muhkamat and the ayat Mutashabihat. These ayat muhkamat, plain and clear. And so you have a hundred thousand tafsir, plural of tafsir, on this. Explaining the ayat muhkamat. But ayat mutashabihat, you don't even have one. Not even one. What is an ayah? Mutashabiha. I did I give you the example yesterday about the white thread? No, I didn't. No. <laughs> the classical example of you don't mind if I take a little bit more time tonight. <laughs> uh, the classical example when you're teaching the subject, this is how you teach it. The classical example of an ayah mutashabiha, or an ayah which has to be interpreted rather than explained, is this one. 
that when we arrived in Yatrim, which is now called Medina, <coughs> we found this large community of Jews. They used to be called Israelites, and now Allah refers to them as Yahud. And we prayed with them in the direction in which they were praying, that is towards <coughs> Jerusalem. Our Qibla was Jerusalem. And we fasted with them in accordance with the law of fasting in their Torah, which was from sunset to sunset, no food, no drink, and you could not go to your wives. But after it became clear that they had rejected the Quran and rejected Nabi Muhammad Islam, and were now conspiring to destroy Islam, then Allah changed the law for us, not for them. They still have to fast in accordance with that law, but for us there's a new law. And uh, Allah refers to this in Surah Al-Baqarah where he says, بَعْدَ أُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا That when Allah changes the law, he always replaces it with one which is better or similar. Not different. Not different. No contradiction. No, no. Better or similar. Not different. So here's the example of one such change. Nask. Allah speaks and he says, Kulu washrabu. Eat and drink during the night time. We're very happy now. Eat and drink hatta يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْتُ الْأَبْيَدُ مِنَ الْخَيْتِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْ Eat and drink until the white thread of dawn is distinct from the black thread. Every Lahori knows about thread because Lahore has the kites. It's called basant. They fly the kites. So every Lahori knows about white thread and black thread. I don't know about Nottingham. So, so this companion, because Nabi Muhammad Islam, offered no explanation or interpretation. So he put a white thread and a black thread underneath his pillow. And in the morning, he's struggling to find out what is the time that the fast will begin. And it's <laughs> difficult. So he came to the Prophet Islam. And it is only at this time and not before that the Prophet ﷺ now gives it a wheel. I don't have the time to explain to you why. He said, when Allah said white thread and that black thread, what he meant was eat and drink until the light of the day is distinct from the darkness of the night. So this is an interpretation of the text. That is ta'wil. When you have to interpret the text, then that is an ayah mutashabiha. And there are many, many ayat mutashabiha in the Quran. Why has Allah put it there? The only one who can interpret the Qur'an is the one who receives knowledge. And Allah will not send that knowledge to them <laughs> who are our enemies. Eh? And he will not send that knowledge to those amongst us who betray us to befriend the state of Israel. Tell that to them for me. Convey that message to them from me. Allah will send that knowledge to those who are faithful to him. The state of Israel is the greatest oppressor in the world today. But these idiots don't understand that. And the government of India today is Israel's most faithful ally in the world today. So if you want to befriend the oppressor, 
get out of our company. We don't want to meet you. Stay away from us. You are traitors. I hope my words reach them. And I hope they terrify them. So then why has Allah given us all these ayat mutashabihat? Because there's knowledge here that they can never access. That's the answer. But when we make an interpretation of the Quran, only, only Allah can confirm that we are correct. So you cannot go out there and establish a new sectarian movement based on interpretation and divide the Muslims. Tell that to Tehran for me. But that does not mean that we do not have the duty to seek to interpret the Quran. But this is not a plaything. You must only interpret the Quran or interpret the Hadith when you are convinced that it is correct, that you are correct, only then do you interpret the Quran or the Hadith. And when you interpret, you must say, Allah knows best. Having said that now, <coughs> the Quran reads, reminds us again and again that the Quran has come to a people who think if you do not think the Quran will dismiss you and uh, I was it yesterday I mentioned it that Dr. Iqbal said about this ummah if I were to say it, they say this man is arrogant but since Dr. Iqbal said it, they got to be silent. He said, this Omar stopped thinking 500, 500 years ago. <laughs> I now, in my old age, I agree, yes, Dr. Iqbal, you are correct. This Omar stopped thinking 500 years ago. If we are to rebuild the house of knowledge in Islam and restore a system of higher Islamic learning and education it has to be done by people who think let's give an example uh, the passage of the quran that was recited at the beginning and uh, nabi isa is speaking to banu israel and he says to them inni rasulullahi ilaykum i am the messenger of allah sent to you I have come to confirm what remains of the Torah with you. And I have come to convey the good news to you of a, of a, of a Rasul who is to come after me and whose name is Ahmad. Now here is a big, big, big invitation to think. <laughs> the Quran is inviting you to think. Is it that he does not know the name? That the name is Muhammad? No. He knows that the name is Muhammad. Why? Because Allah says in the Quran, kitab. And Allah will teach him the Quran. hikmah, And Allah will give him wisdom. What Torah will injil and Allah will teach him after the Quran, Allah will teach him the Torah and the Injil. But in the Quran, Allah refers to him as Muhammad. That's his name. 
wa ma Muhammad illa rasul. Hmm? Four times in the Quran Allah refers to him by the name Muhammad. So why does he use the word Ahmad? It's a very big invitation to think. And have they been thinking? This is why Iqbal is so correct. Why does he use the word Ahmad when Allah uses the word Muhammad? Sallallahu ta'ala said. You will not get the answer unless you think. Not Mirza Ghulam Ahmad's way, of course. <laughs> no, that misguided man. <coughs> when you think, and when you go to the totality of all the verses of the Quran on the subject of the relationship between this Ummah and his Ummah, the Ummah of Nabi Muhammad والسلام, and his Ummah, the Ummah of Nabi Isa والسلام, and you look in the Quran at the relationship between the two, then you'll understand why he used the word Ahmad. When you love someone, when you have intense love for someone, you never use their name. As simple as that. You always have a love name for the person. And it is his intense love, intense love for Nabi Muhammad that he gives him a secret name, a special name. And if you and I are alive when Nabi Isa Islam returns, you will hear him. Anytime he refers to our Nabi, he will always use the word Ahmad. And he's sending a message as well. This is critical thinking. That in the same way the two of us are so close to each other. Because Nabi Muhammad said, he said, when Nabi Isa dies, and you know it, he said he'll be buried next to me. And you know it. If this is the love that exists between these two men, how painful would it be for them that this ummah is boxing with boxing gloves with this ummah? Huh? And when a scholar of Islam approaches the Torah and approaches the Injil, and he does so with a sword in his hand, to find everything that is nasty, everything that is disgusting, everything that is shameful, everything that must clearly be in conflict with the Quran, and bring it out. And then the whole world of Islam start clapping. What a great scholar he is! What a great scholar he is! What a great scholar! We want to debate! Yes, all of this bunch of sheep and goats. Is that the way these two men are with each other? No. Rather than approach the, the scripture of the Hindus and the scripture of the Jews and the Christians with a sword in your hand, why don't you approach them with respect and search in those scriptures for whatever remnant of truth you can find? And whatever you find which is confirmed by the Quran is, of course, truth. And when you locate truth in the Vedas, the Hindu scriptures, you show respect for it. Instead of vile comments and nasty comments and waging endless wars of hatred and enmity and venom, against all Hindus. Is that what this Ummah has become today? Is this where the schoolboys who are scholars have taken us? Eh? No, when you find truth in a scripture other than the Quran, 
You recognize it as truth. You show respect for it. And if the people who are following that scripture, they have forgotten that truth, then you go to them <laughs> gently and lead them back to the truth which is with them, rather than say, take the shahada, take the shahada, take the shahada. Which one is the most sensible way? Which one is wise? Huh? Is it not the take them to the truth which is with them? And when they restore that truth which is with them, then gently guide them to a greater truth. These people would respect you. And with these people, you can build friendship and eventually alliance. Here is an example. Ismuhu Ahmad of what we could do if we approach the Quran with a with the proper methodology of thinking. Uh, I, I want to spend a little time, if you don't mind now, sharing with you what is not being done in our institutions of higher Islamic learning, which is why we are in the mess in which we are today, <coughs> which is why Pakistan is sunk in riba with no way to get out. And they had to go and bow down before the IMF and borrow six billion to pay interest so that they wouldn't default to pay interest. And the price Pakistan had to pay, and you know it better than I do, is that they had to dismiss the finance minister and replace him with an IMF man and dismiss the governor of the central bank and replace him with an IMF man. That was the pound of flesh that the IMF wanted. And so now Pakistan is deeper in the hole than they were before. Where are the scholars of Islam? Where are those who are supposed to go to the Quran? and locate in the Quran that which will explain this economic and monetary predicament and who would provide guidance to the government of Pakistan how to get out. Hmm? I will in the question and answer session, or maybe I mentioned it yesterday what we could do. Yes, I did, I think. Let us now turn to methodology for the study of the Quran. If we are to build a new house of learning, learning based on the Quran. It is in Surah Al-Waqiyah, but as with so many other surahs in the Quran, Imran, you know, he reciting and reciting and reciting every month, every month, every month, and it simply doesn't click. His eyes are going over the ayah, and he doesn't penetrate until one day, one day, suddenly it clicks. The, I'm sorry, this is my, like an old Ford, this is how I operate. But there are others like Suleiman, alayhi salam, mashallah, like this. And he understands, in a flash, in a flash, Suleiman, alayhi salam. Surah al -Waqiyah. And Allah makes a, Qasam. He takes an oath and he says, Ba'da wuzi billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Fala uksimu bimawaqe in nujum. And I swear, I take an oath by the positions in which the stars are located. And then he goes on to say, Wa innahu la qasamun law ta'lamun azim. He said, This is the mother of all roots. This is the mother of all qasam. This is 
Iqasam law ta'alamun azim. This is a tremendously important oath that I have taken. When I say I swear by the positions in which the stars are located. And then he goes on to say, Innahu the Quran on Karim. Fi kitab in Maknun. This is really a noble and generous Quran. Generous means constantly giving, constantly giving, constantly giving. And it is located in a book which is protected. So I am now invited to think. I hope you also will believe that you are invited to think. What is the connection between the two? The positions in which the stars are located and this book which is so generous so noble. What is the relationship between the two? <coughs> it takes less than a few minutes of thinking to realize that Allah is saying Unless and until you use this methodology, you will never be able to study this book. That in the same way that you have to study the positions in which the stars are located to be able to read the stars, to know direction for binajmi hum yahtadun, to be able to know in which direction the ship must travel, in the same way you have to study this Quran. You don't study the stars by beginning with Surah Al-Baqarah and then Surah to Ali Imran and then Surah to Nisa and then Surah to Al-Ma'idah. That is not the way you study the stars. No. Who studies the stars like that? You have to take one star and see how it's connected to that star and how it's connected to this star. And that requires insight. And insight is not sold in the supermarket. You got to work before Allah will bless you with insight. And he knows those who are faithful to his book. And he knows those who are negligent to his book. And so this is the fundamental verse of the Quran. And if we neglect this, guess what he says? Now tell me if you have the capacity to think. Is he talking when he says none can touch it except the clean and pure? Is he talking about? Eh? Is he talking about this? Eh? I mean, a little bit of thinking. A little bit of thinking. What relevance, what connection can there possibly be? between the positions of the stars where they are located and the methodology for studying the Quran and to be clean to touch the book. Is there any link between the two? If you accept that this is literal, that this is muhkama, that you have to be clean, you have to make wudu, you have to be clean. A woman when the men says cannot touch the Quran. Huh? Then I tell you, Anyone can go in the super, go in the bookstore and buy a copy of the Quran and can touch it, so then the Quran will be false. Because he's not clean, he just had a nice dinner or lunch with pork, full of pork in his stomach, and he's holding the Quran. So the Quran is false. So it could not be literal. <laughs> it could not be literal. It is not mukkam. Some scholars say, no, no, no. 
Allah is referring to that Quran which is there in heaven. La yamasuhu illa al-mutahharun. <laughs> My response is, over there, there are none unclean. <laughs> so then, we dismiss that as well. La yamasuhu, you cannot even touch. You cannot even touch the knowledge and the wisdom that is located in this Quran. If your heart is unclean, if you're not faithful to Allah, if you betray Allah. No, 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 I can't say that. If I speak like that, my business will collapse. You're unclean. <laughs> if I speak like that, they put my name on a no-fly list. No, 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 you can't come and lecture in our masjid because the British government will be very annoyed. Huh? Is that cleanliness in the heart? لا يمسه إلا المتحرون You, this is, oh my gosh, what a terrible warning. You will never succeed in even touching the knowledge in this Quran. If you are unclean, and unclean is a very strong word, eh? Unclean, because you're not faithful to Allah. Let me, I wish I had another one hour, but I don't. Let me give you one classic example of connecting the stars. And not all stars can be connected until a certain time arrives in the historical process. You could even be a Ghazali. But at the time when you lived, it was not as yet possible to be able to locate the link between this and that. So we do not look down at those who came before us. When in this age we were able to locate something that they did not locate before, it's because the time had not yet arrived. Here are two passages in the Quran that are linked to each other. One is in um, one is in Surah uh, Saad, uh, and the other is in Surah Sabah. And they are linked to each other. But unless you have insight, unless you can connect the dots, you would not know that they are linked. There is no external knowledge out there to link it. It is internal knowledge. It is insight. In Surah to Saad, Suleiman alayhi salam is the king and the prophet. And the holy state of Israel, which is the Khilafah state in Jerusalem, is the ruling state in the world. In the sense that there is no rival that can threaten it. None. So he who sits on the throne of Israel is ruling the world. <coughs> and one day Allah shows him something. And he sees someone sitting on his throne. He did not permit that fellow to sit on the throne. And if someone is occupying my throne and I'm the king, I'll call the guards, take him and throw him out of the window. He must be crazy. He fit for the madhouse. Who is he sitting on my throne? Suleiman. <laughs> We tested him. We gave him something which caused him distress, fitna, by placing a jasad on his throne. Leave the word jasad for the time being, we return to it. When he saw that jasad sitting on his throne, <coughs> Me, I would take a year or two years to be able to penetrate it. That's my speed. But he, in an instant, immediately he understood. 
He understood that this Jasad was an evil being. And that this Jasad wants to inherit my throne. And therefore to rule the world from the holy state of Israel in Jerusalem, this Jasad. And I don't want that to happen. So Allah was showing him a vision. It could not be an actual event. And Allah was telling him about something which is to come, an event which is to come. And I, for example, I, from the time I, I understood that that just said is Dajjal, who is an evil being who wants to rule the world from Jerusalem, from the state of Israel, so he can declare, I am an al I am the Messiah. So from the time he saw this vision, Summa Anabi turned to Allah penitently. Qala Rabbik firli, wahab li mulkan la yambagi li ahadi min ba'di. He wanted to ask something from Allah. And his way of asking, which is a sunnah that we should accept, is first seek forgiveness for sins and then ask. So he's not asking for any particular sin he committed. Not so, only the schoolboy would go on that fishing expedition. What sin did he commit? No, no, no. It is a general way. If you want to ask something from Allah, first ask for forgiveness. Call a rabbi firli. Wahabli mulkan la yambagi li ahadi min ba'di. And grant that none can inherit my kingdom after me. Because I don't want him to inherit my kingdom. I prefer that my kingdom should collapse rather than that he should inherit my kingdom. That's the first meaning. But there's a second meaning. And grant that there could never be another state like my state, another kingdom comparable to mine. That's the second meaning. And Nabi Muhammad said, now here is the connection, connecting the dots between the Hadith and the Quran. Sulaiman had the jinn and they worked for him in several verses of the Quran. And if any jinn disobeyed, he was punished. Yes. And amongst the jinn, they had the shayateen. The shayateen were obliged to work for him. This is in the Quran. Why? Allah knows best. I could not understand. No, Allah knows best. So Nabi Muhammad one morning he said to the people at the time of Fajr, last night I had a fight with Shaitan and I defeated him. And I was going to tie him to the pillars of the masjid. And when you came to the masjid for Salat, you'd have seen Iblis tied to the pillars of the masjid. Then I remembered the dua of my brother Suleiman and I had to release him. Now you see the connection? Hmm? And so now we know that Allah accepted his dua. And as soon as Suleiman died, holy Israel collapsed, never to be restored. This one is an imposter, never to be restored. We leave Surah to Saad and we go to Surah to Sabah. And this is your, if you don't mind my using the word, this is your homework. <laughs> if you don't mind my using this term, this is your homework. To go now and check out, to see what connection there is between that passage in Surah to Saad and this passage in Surah to Sabah. And when Suleiman alayhi salam died, Walamma qadayna Suleiman al maut When Suleiman alayhi salam died, 
in Surah Al-Sabah, Ma dallahu man mauti illa dabbatul ab. The traditional understanding was nobody knew he was dead and his body remained sitting <laughs> on the throne holding on to the staff for I don't know how long until the battle art came and the battle art uh, two mites did you hear that? termites and they start nibbling the bottom of his staff one day Hollywood might make a movie of this and uh, when they had nibbled enough from the bottom of the staff and the staff lost its balance then the body of Suleiman collapsed and only then did the world know he was dead So you don't mind my asking some question, do you? So I said to myself, well, wait a minute. What about when lunchtime came? And when dinner time came? Didn't they bring food for him? Huh? What about going to sleep in the night? What about going to the toilet and so on? Uh, nobody ever thought about it? Was it that the whole kingdom went to sleep when he died? So I said this, excuse me, this looks like a load of rubbish to me. It couldn't be correct. No. <laughs> then I realized, no, no, no. <coughs> Everybody knew he was dead. Everybody knew he was buried. But the jinn who was shayateen, they were in chains in another world of space and time and they did not know he was dead they did not know and the reason why they were fooled was because they were seeing someone sitting on his throne holding on to his staff Now, do you see the connection between Sabah and Saad? Hmm? Yes, it was the Jasad sitting on the throne. And then when the battle out came and nibbled, the Quran doesn't say nibble, ta'kulu min sa'atuhu, ta'kulu, to consume. So, I sent to the eminent scholars of the Arabic language who were specialized in the Arabic of the Quran. One with a PhD in Arabic semantics of the Quran and the other with a PhD in Quranic Arabic. I sent to them. I said, help me. What is min sa'ah? Asar, the staff, is with sa'ad. And this is a scene, Minsa. And they both replied to me, and they said, Minsa is the walking stick, walking stick, the staff. <laughs> After having gotten the response of the highest caliber of scholarship in Quranic Arabic, I was not satisfied because it didn't match the methodology of the Quran. I said, no. It is not the way of Allah that he should use the word asa 14, 15 times in the Quran for stuff. And in one solitary instance, he would use another word. That doesn't sound correct. So when I continued struggling with the word minsa, I then realized that you're dealing with the system of time. The system of time, uh, which we will touch upon uh, in my lecture two nights from now in Rest Inshallah, the Quran and the Moon. That the Min Sa'a 
was a property of the stuff with which you could intervene in the system of time. And if you intervene in the system of time, you could move back and forth in time. And so while holding on to the stuff, he was able to portray images of Suleiman alayhi salam alive, walking, talking, eating, moving, sitting, standing. And that's why the jinn were taken for a ride. But when Dabatul Ad came and consumed the minsa of the stuff, which is not as yet occurred, it still happened. Then the staff would lose its property to intervene in the system of time. And then the jinn will be able to see this is not Suleiman al Islam, this is an imposter, this is the Jasad. And who is the Jasad? Now I've given you the proof of the connection between these two passages. This star and that star are now connected. Imam al Ghazali did not do it. No. Dr. Ibal did not do it. My teacher did not do it. That does not mean that I am superior to these men. It is because the time had not as yet come. It was not possible in their age. Allah has made it possible now. That does not make me in any way superior. I am fit to clean the shoes of these men. Not fit to even clean their shoes. So my presenting this link between those new stars does not make me superior to them. In any way, forget that. Now then, what's a jasad? And I'll finish the talk. It's too long now. I'm giving you a taste of the scholarship which is to come. When we rebuild the house of knowledge in Islam, that Faisal is struggling for. Mm -hmm. And a new kind of Darul Rum emerges that will now be able to study the Quran the way it ought to be studied, and then be able to advise the government of Pakistan how you deal with this problem. The Quran refers to the golden calf as Jasad. The Samari had said, give me a gold, and he <laughs> melted it and made a golden calf. He said, this is your God, worship it. And the Quran refers to that golden calf as a jasad, a body without a soul. But this has to be a human being who wants to inherit the throne. You can't take a, a um, Texas cow and put him on the throne to inherit the throne. <laughs> has to be a human being. But this human being is not fully human. He's a jasad. There's something he lacks, which human beings have, which, which, which is what makes him a jasad. And our, my book is the Dajjal, the, the Quran, and the jasad, but we don't have it at the back. It should be here in Britain maybe another week from now. It's my last book. This, um, the Dajjal is a Jasad. And I say he's a Jasad because he does not have the Ruh that Allah breathed into the human being. The Ruh that is breathed into the human being has freedom, the Amana. Freedom to think and therefore to make mistakes. <laughs> and freedom to choose this way or that way. The Dajjal does not have that freedom. He is externally programmed to think and to act. And now comes the most dangerous part of the subject. Because he is externally programmed to think and to act, his master plan is to reduce all of mankind to become just as like himself. And they are our enemies, will program us to think and program us to act. And the smartphone <laughs> is an integral part. And the television is an integral part of that master plan to brainwash us so that eventually we lose the capacity to think and to think independently and lose the capacity to choose independently. And they choose for us and they think for us. I pray 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might bless the efforts of Faisal and his team here in Nottingham and our dear audience here tonight to return to the Quran and to recite the Quran as it ought to be recited, which is my next lecture. And when you're reciting the Quran as it ought to be recited, to then proceed to study the Quran as it ought to be studied. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tu'alayna ya mulana inna ka anta tawabu rahim wa rahmatika ya akumur rahimin. Ameen. My lecture was supposed to be one hour longer than this. One hour longer. I had to cut out one hour. 